Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about atomic theory, especially the history of the discovery of the atom, so that we can better understand the atom a little bit. So first we have to talk about Democritus. He was the first guy that came up and proposed the idea of an atom. The problem is he had no experimental evidence. He just had this thought experiment that he did about a rock and if I divide this rock up I'm still gonna have a rock but eventually I'll get down to the smallest available piece that he called Atmos and Atmos was a Greek word that meant um, indivisible but the problem is is there was a most more influential philosopher Aristotle his ideas were more widely accepted and because they were the ideas of the day they were also uh, taken so Democritus's ideas were forgotten for almost 2,000 years actually there's Democritus's uh, atomic model. It looks like just like a sphere, a ball. He did have this idea that maybe the ball would be slightly different for a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Um, so he described that as well. Then we go to John Dalton in 1803. Now, from the late 1800 or 1700s to this 1803 time, Dalton had been doing experiments um, with gases and other compounds, along with Priestley, Prost, and Lavoisier. And he noticed when things reacted, they always seemed to do the same thing. So he proposed that there were these things called atoms that were indivisible, indestructible particles that represented each kind of element, and that atoms of the same element were exactly the same. Atoms of different elements were completely and totally different. And then he said, when atoms combine together, they form compounds in the same specific ratio each time. This was the beginning of the ideas of the law of multiple and definite proportions. This, as well as Democritus's idea, is Dalton's atomic vision. This is what he said the, the atom would look like. And you can see it's very similar to what Democritus said with the whole spherical thing. Yeah, it's blue, I know. Don't worry about that. Okay, next is Joseph John Thompson, or J.J. Thompson. His discoveries were actually, were actually published in 1897. They probably began occurring sometime in the 1870s because of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so he used something called a cathode ray tube, and a magnetic field to bend the resulting stream of light when he bent the resulting stream of light, he discovered that things had to have electrons in them. So here's a cathode ray tube. This is what a cathode ray tube looks like. His may have been a little bit more crude, but basically the same thing. And here's what a cathode ray tube looks like when a magnet is actually um, used to change the light stream. In this particular case, that must be a negative part of the magnet or one pole of the magnet that is pushing the negative particles away. Um, if you flipped it, it would actually bend the negative or bend the negative particles toward it because it would be positive. This changed the idea of Dalton's atoms because atoms now had parts, so atoms were no longer indivisible. So he also developed something called the plum pudding model. I think in class we talked about it being the butter pecan ice cream model. Same idea. The plum pudding model is this like spherical idea that there are little pieces in it um, that represent the negative, but then the main body or the bulk would represent the positive. So in the case of the butter pecan ice cream, the pecans represent the negative, and the buttery cream represents where the positive was found for John Thompson, or Joseph John Thompson, J.J. Thompson. Okay, next, in 1911, was Ernest Rutherford. Um, Ernest Rutherford was actually the first graduate student of J.J. Thompson, and so he was very familiar with Thompson's work. But Rutherford, at the time, was also really into um, this radioactive research that the Curies and Becquerel and some other people had been working on. So Rutherford used not only Thompson's research, but this radioactive research to devise an experiment to test Thompson's theory. Um, he was actually under the assumption that Thompson was completely correct about the atom. So it was the gold foil experiment that led to the discovery of the atom that was different than Thompson. So here we have a gold foil experiment set up. So you see that we have this um, emitter here um, that's emitting these radioactive alpha particles. Okay, sorry about that. You've got the emitter here that's emitting radioactive alpha particles. You've got a screen around the gold foil that's actually going to detect the alpha particles. And what Thompson discovered, or what, what, what Rutherford discovered is that most of the particles went straight through the gold foil. Now, with Thompson's proposal, 
I don't think Rutherford was truly expecting that. Then he saw that some of them deflected, went through, but deflected. Very few of them came back, which is kind of what he expected if you think about Thompson's model and this whole idea of a solid sphere. So Rutherford came up with this idea that atoms had a densely packed center with positive charge and that the atom was made of mostly empty space because somewhere between where these electrons that Thompson had discovered and this densely packed positive charge that Rutherford discovered was where the atom was. So Rutherford's atom looks something like this and I, I want to make sure that you understand all of these electrons are somewhere out here in the edge of this sphere whereas the nucleus is in the center. So if you think about a ball and you think about the nucleus being in the very center of the ball, uh, Rutherford kind of stated that all of the electrons were on the outside of the ball and between the outside of the ball and the center where the nucleus was there was nothing in between there and so that's what we see there. Next is Niels Bohr and again Bohr was actually a student of both Thomson and Rutherford. So Bohr came along, he had all of this information from the two, he was very familiar with both of them, he knew that Rutherford had come up with something different and again he was looking for some things that would help him with what he needed to understand. So he used Rutherford's evidence and this new theory by Max Planck that electrons should be quantas of energy. They should give off a certain amount of energy all the time. And he used the spectral analysis of hydrogen to make a, his own interpretation of the atomic model. So he used Rutherford's atom. He used this equation that energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the wave and these hydrogen spectra that he was seeing from stars and other things that he was using. And from all of this, he developed this newer version of the atom. It's very similar to Rutherford's, except that the electrons, instead of being in the outside of the spherical plane, Thompson, or Bohr said that they must be in orbits because they're able to gain different amounts of energy and return back to their ground state. So he developed this idea that there were these concentric rings, sort of like uh, the solar system, the planets in the solar system around the sun, that would make a difference. But the problem is, it only worked for a hydrogen atom. And so it fell apart after that. So it comes along Erwin Schrodinger. I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing that correctly, according to Vincent Bauman. I'm not at all. But that's the English pronunciation of Schrodinger. Okay, so he comes along and he realized that the answer to the atom couldn't be found in this classical physics that, that we have been trying to use. Instead, he, he proposed this quantum theory that actually Planck had begun working on. Schrodinger says electrons could act both like particles and waves and then use that to develop this mathematical equation called a wave function. This is Schrodinger's wave function. Now, if you look at that, it looks pretty intense because it is. It's a calculus-based equation. And there are all kinds of things going on here. But you do see the h, which is Planck's constant here. Um, the psi is actually the wave function, the wave particulation of that particular atom. And then m is something to do with some distance or mass relationship that we have. So he was using the ideas of Einstein equals mc squared of Planck and this idea of a wave and he developed this new equation. And what he ends up saying is the wave function combines the behaviors of the atom so that we can explain where the electron can be at least 90 percent of the time. So Schrodinger comes up with this particular view that we have these different spaces that the electron can occupy and those different spaces have different shapes that are based upon the wave function. But in reality Schrodinger's view of the atom was more of this electron cloud where the dense center there, the dark center, is where the nucleus is and then as you keep going out further, there's where the, where the electrons can lie. And we can't see the specifics. We can just see this cloud. So that's pretty much where we are in the whole scheme of atomic theory right now. So this is um, what you need to know in essence about the history of the atom and where we are. That does not mean that there aren't other theories out there right now that are being proposed. But this, for chemists, is probably the best way to explain what we see. 
we'll delve a little deeper when we get back from break into all of this a little bit more.